Uh, at this time, uh, Roy is the Vice President of the Central Appalachian Astronomy Club. Roy? Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, just a little short note there. Um, <clears throat> I contacted Mr. Noya here last year, probably around October, November. At that time, he actually had to clear his schedule. He had to rearrange some things to come see us this year. And uh, talked to him several times in the past. Uh, I was just made aware of his bio about the time we got it to put on our program. So, uh, <clears throat> it's pretty impressive. Uh, he's got his degree from uh, science jour journalism from Boston University. He's worked uh, for both the astronomy and sky and telescope. So, uh, like I said, I just want to introduce Mr. Robert Noya. Editor-in-Chief of Sky and Telescope Magazine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Roy for pronouncing my last name correctly. <laughs> we learned how to spell it just a couple weeks ago. That's right, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to know, it's a Flemish and uh, it's pronounced Noia like paranoia. Uh, Do you want some uh, mic? Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Can everybody hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so, so, as I think uh, you know from the program, my topic tonight will be on amateur exoplanet discoveries. And before I get started, I want to First of all, thank Roy for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. I've had a great time here the last couple days. Um, I want to thank all the people who organized the Green Bank StarQuest. Let's all give them a hand. <laughs> Having uh, previously worked at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, in which we, you know, every year organize an annual meeting, I, I know how much work goes into planning an event like this. And I know that Roy and his colleagues uh, put a lot of time and effort so we can all have a good time. Although I guess we have to blame them a little bit for not giving us better weather. They should have planned that better. <laughs> so, and I also want to thank uh, the NRAO for, I mean, that's really generous of them to give us the run of their facilities. And, you know, from what I've seen, they've been very generous in letting us use their facilities and giving us tours and all that. So I really, Really appreciate that. This is my second time to Green Bank. I might actually be here just uh, a few months from now. I'm also speaking in September at the uh, uh, Almost Heaven Star Party, which is held very near here on Spruce Knob. So I might actually be back here at Green Bank in just a few months. And I just want to also thank all of you for coming. And I hope you're still having a great time despite the, uh, despite the disappointing skies. OK, so my talk tonight, of course, is about amateur science. <laughs> Um, and I think a lot of you know this, that if you go back even more decades, even more than 100 years, astronomers have made, a, amateur astronomers have made a very impressive contribution to science. And in fact, that's one reason I think I'm interested in astronomy, uh, you know, and maybe contrast to other sciences, because it's really an area that for a very long period of time, Amateurs have been able to play a significant role. For example, it's hard to think of like amateur, amateur you know, microbiologists. I certainly wouldn't want to have surgery done by like an amateur heart surgeon. Um, whereas on the other hand, I put a lot of trust in amateur scientists who do astronomy. And so do the professionals, as I'll, I'll make clear tonight. So over here, I kind of just list some areas where over the decades, Amateurs have made very significant contributions to science. For, you know, for example, monitoring variable stars, eclipsing binaries, discovering and uh, characterizing uh, novae and supernovae, discovering and tracking asteroids and comets, etc., etc. But despite th these very impressive accomplishments, very few astronomers, like let's say I was giving this talk 20 years ago and saying that you know, amateurs someday are going to play an important role in discovering and studying planets around other stars. This is what you guys would have said to me. <laughs> so uh, I think I'll make the case tonight, uh, you know, that, uh, that they actually have. So let's just uh, step back for a moment and consider where we were in uh, mid-1995 and then look at how far we've come in just 18 years. Um, in mid-1995, astronomers, and you can see right here, did not know of a single planet 
orbiting a normal star outside the solar system. Now at that point, they, there, there were three exoplanets known orbiting a pulsar, but there were none known orbiting a star similar to the sun. Now I checked the web this morning, uh, and I didn't use my, uh, my uh, uh, airport. I, I did it with my ethernet cable, because I didn't want to uh, interfere with the observations here at Green Bank. But I checked the website, exoplanets.eu. That's the extrasolar encyclopedia. And according to them, there are 910 known planets outside the solar system. So let's just say we'll include Pluto. That means we now know of 100 times more planets outside the solar system than inside the solar system. And uh, I don't know if people can read at the bottom, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope has discovered about 30,500 very good candidate exoplanets. And most of those are real planets, probably well over 90, and maybe as many as 95% of those candidates are real. So in other words, we probably actually know right now more than 4,000 planets outside the solar system, which, you know, considering that progress in just 18 years, um, I would say that's mind-boggling. Um, now, exoplanets are, are important to both scientists and the public, really for two reasons. The first one is, they, by studying other systems, we learn about how planetary systems form and evolve. And I think, of course, the really big question is uh, by learning about planets around other stars, we start to gain a better understanding for how common uh, is life in the universe. You know, as far as we know, life is a phenomenon that you, you know, we associate with planets. So the more planets there are out there in our galaxy, uh, the better, you know, the chances for uh, extraterrestrial life. I should mention our latest issue, the one that uh, subscribers should have already received and that's on the newsstand right now, is the cover story is by a very brilliant exoplanet researcher at MIT named Sarah Seeger, and it sort of is a really comprehensive summary of what we know right now about exoplanets. One very conservative statement that we can make is based on the frequency of planets that have been discovered, we can say there are probably at least 100 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, at least 100 billion, at least about one per star. Okay, so not only now do we know about 900 plus exoplanets, we're actually starting to learn about some of the characteristics, the density, the composition, some of their weather patterns, uh, what, you know, what they, what's going on in the upper atmospheres of these worlds. And as I'll uh, show, I'm not nuts when I say that amateurs have been playing a key role. And I know for an absolute fact by talking to people like Sarah Seeger, Jeff Marcy, and other leading exoplanet researchers, that they very much appreciate and have a very, very high level of respect for the amateurs who are doing this work. Okay, so I'm going to go back for a minute and I, you know, probably a lot of you know this already, but most of the planets that have been discovered to date, and certainly the first do few dozen found around normal stars, were discovered by using what's known as the radial velocity method, or also known as the wobble method. Let me just go back and restart this movie. You'll notice the planet here going around the star, but the star <coughs> responds to the gravitational you know, uh, you know, energy of the planet. So the star is also tracing a little wobble. And when that wobble happens, you can see the, le uh, the diagram at the upper left. When the star is then moving toward Earth, its spectral lines are shifted to the blue. When the star is moving away, the, the spectral lines are shifted toward the red. So by looking at the spectrum of other stars, we can deduce the presence of, uh, of orbiting uh, planetary companions. The very first planet discovered using this method, and of course the first star found around a solar type star, was in mid-1995 around a star actually very similar to the sun, a little uh, hotter and more evolved than the sun, called 51 Pegasi b. I'm sure here from Green Bank on a clear night it would be visible to the naked eye, 
Uh, I can't remember, I think it's a fourth or fifth magnitude star. And the planet was discovered by the two astronomers at the upper left, uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Kalo of the Geneva Observatory in Switzerland. Uh, for, for some of you who remember, this was you know, a watershed event in the history of astronomy, and it did make news worldwide. The one bizarre thing, though, uh, there's their radial velocity plot on the lower left showing the motion of the star going away and toward Earth. Um, is that the planet was completely unexpected. It's a planet about, you know, maybe half to one Jupiter mass in an orbit that's only four days. So it uh, was the prototype of a class of planets that I'll be talking a lot about tonight called a hot Jupiter. It's like taking Jupiter and moving it so it's just, you know, almost just barely beyond you know, the stellar, uh, the star's chromosphere whipping around the star in just a few days with its upper atmosphere heated to thousands of degrees. Certainly not a planet that uh, was, was expected. Okay, the next two planets then were found by uh, an American team, uh, Paul Butler on the left and Jeff Marcy on the right, uh, who were then working out at, uh, at the University of California. Uh, Jeff Marcy, by the way, is, is on the Kepler team now. Uh, Marcy has discovered more exoplanets than any human being in history, or more planets total than any uh, human being in history. And not only that, uh, he's never had to retract any of his announced planets. He's a very, very careful scientist, so in essence, his batting average is 1,000. Uh, here's a, just a, showing a radial velocity plot of one of their first two planets called 47 Ursae Majoris B. Uh, this is a world about maybe two or three times the mass of Jupiter. You can see at the, in the middle there, the distance from the star is 2.1 AU. That would essentially put it you know, in, in the asteroid belt were it orbiting the sun. Their other planet was kind of a weirdo. You can see, for those of you in the front at least, you can see at the lower right, this is a planet with a very skewed uh, plot on the left, and that's due to a very highly eccentric orbit or elongated orbit. Uh, this is a planet with about seven times the mass of Jupiter that orbits um, you know, kind of between Mercury and Venus if it were in our solar system, but in a highly elongated orbit. This is a planet that probably was the survivor of a system that started off with more planets and they started to perturb each other. Some of the planets got uh, slingshotted out into the uh, frozen depths of intergalactic space, leaving behind this very, very massive planet. Some might even characterize this object as more like a brown dwarf than a planet. The distinction is still a little bit fuzzy. Um, so by the late 1990s, uh, astronomers had discovered dozens of exoplanets. We, ha we had the three pulsar planets, and then several dozen of these planets discovered by radial velocity. But at that point, you know, astronomers are eager to take the next step, you know, starting to really understand the nature of these worlds, not just their mass and orbit, but what are they like, you know, their atmospheres, their compositions, uh, what are their densities, you know, et cetera. And then, of course, another big goal, especially for those interested in extraterrestrial life, is finding smaller planets, you know, the ones the size of Earth, that as far as we know, based on our one known example of life, have the best prospects for harboring life as we know it. So another method uh, for finding planets is using what are called transits. Let me play that back. And you'll notice as the planet crosses across the star, you'll notice, look at the light curve at the bottom, you see a very brief, uh, but, but very discernible drop in the star's light. This is very similar in concept to you know, the observations of uh, transits of Venus and Mars. Of course, we just had a Venus transit just about a year ago. I, I've, I know some of the people here in the audience saw it. How many people uh, saw either the 2004 or the 2012 transit of Venus? That's great. I, I figured it would be a pretty high percentage. And if memory serves me correctly, there's a, a Mercury transit coming up in 2016, and if I'm remembering properly, North America is very well positioned to see it. So for those of you who missed the Venus transit, you still got, you can see another planet transit in just, uh, in just about two years, or three years. 
Um, so late 1999 was the big breakthrough because that year there were two different teams, both professionals. One was a team led by Dave Charbonneau, who works at the Harvard Center, uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. By the way, if you ever meet Dave, you'll immediately know it. He's about like six foot eight tall. He's actually originally from Canada, uh, but he's a great guy, but he's very, very tall. So when he walks into a room, you immediately uh, notice his presence. And he was working with uh, Tim Brown, who uh, works at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. Then independently, an astronomer named Greg Henry at uh, Tennessee State University, what they detected was that a known planet, this was a planet that had been discovered by Marcy and Butler in the radio velocity work that w was known to orbit the star HD 209458. Uh, they discovered that this planet, in fact, at the predicted time, passes in front of the star and blocks a little bit of the light. And so uh, because it, blo it, it blocks some of the star's light, and we know the spectral type and type of the star, uh, by measuring how much of the star's light is blocked, that tells you the radius of the planet. And because you know the mass from the radial velocity, uh, you, and, and because you know the size from the transit, you can then calculate the density of the planet. How, uh, and it turns out at the bottom here, I don't know if some of you can see it, but the density is 0 0.35 grams per cubic centimeter. Of course, water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So this is a very, very low density world. It's kind of like a puffed up Saturn or so. Uh, it's in between actually Saturn and Jupiter in mass, but its diameter is about one and a half Jupiters in diameter. So it's a very, very puffed up planet, uh, likely because of its very close proximity to the star. Its orbital period is only three and a half days which is pretty ridiculous, at least by solar system standards. Okay, this is where the amateurs enter the picture. Less than a year later, after this transit had been announced, a group of amateurs in Finland decided to see if they could detect the transit because it's a, it's a big planet, it's fairly close to the star, and it's a relatively bright star, and you can see their light curve at the upper left that shows the brightness of the star over time you can see that very pronounced dip. And this was actually a very easy detection. Uh, the group, by the way, you can see R R2 Oksanen from the Nairoli, uh, Nairola Observatory in Finland uh, using a Mead telescope and an SBIG uh, CCD camera. And it turned out, I mean, this was not a marginal detection. Uh, you know, this was, was a very clear and obvious detection. And this, you know, this sent the signal to the whole amateur community around the world that amateurs could now enter the exoplanet game. Uh, by about 2000, uh, amateurs had access to good enough and affordable CCD cameras that they could monitor star, the brightness of stars to a precision of about 1%. And because a, a hot Jupiter causes a decrease in the star's brightness of maybe like two, three, or four percent, that's definitely good enough to do this type of measurement. No and there's no doubt at this time that amateurs could detect exoplanet transits. And uh, of course, the technology got better and better. CCD cameras improved. The software got better. Amateurs improved their technique. So right now, amateurs are currently achieving about 0.1 percent precision and their photometric, that's you know, monitoring the brightness of a star over time uh, because of this equipment. And, and you know, that's easily good enough uh, you know, to detect a lot of the known transiting exoplanets. Um, and just to show you that you don't even need a big telescope, this is Tim Brown, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, now, he's a professional, but he actually discovered a transiting exoplanet with a four-inch telescope. You can see his telescope at the upper left. Uh, this was a telescope based in the Canary Islands. This was a planet that was discovered by the transit and then confirmed by doing the radial velocity. Usually it's the other way around, but this one he discovered the transits. Um, so how many of you in the audience have at least a telescope of four inches in aperture? 
I figure to be a pretty high percentage. So the, the key here is you don't even need a big telescope to do this. Um, now, just eight days after Brown announced this planet publicly, a Belgian amateur astronomer, Tani van Munster, who's been very active in this research, he decided to try to detect it from his home observatory. He uses a 14-inch Celestron, and, uh, he had, and you can see his light curve at the upper right, right and uh, he had no, uh, no problem uh, detecting it. In fact, his photometric data is so good that the professionals used his data to help pin down the diameter of the planet, which, of course, then you can calculate the density. Um, Another key thing about these transiting planets, this is something that amateurs can't do, at least not yet, but it shows you the importance of transiting planets, is during the transit, the sum of the star's light is passing through the upper atmosphere of the planet, inducing absorption lines. You know, some of the molecules and elements in the upper atmosphere of the planet are going to absorb some of the light from the star and leave an imprint. Now, when you look at the star when the planet is not in transit, those lines go away. So you can really make a very clear-cut detection with this, um, you know, especially right now Hubble is doing this. Certainly when the James Webb Space Telescope launches, that's going to be a very high priority yeah. because you could use this type of observation to uh, find evidence of life on another planet if you found, let's say, things like ozone, carbon dioxide, and water vapor on an exoplanet. But this has now been done on several dozen planets where they have found things like sodium, CO2, carbon monoxide, and methane have been detected in the atmospheres of extrasolar planets that transit their stars. So you can see how valuable these transiting exoplanets are and why they're so cherished by, uh, by professional astronomers. Another thing you can do, this is an experiment that's been done with Spitzer, is if the planet transits, in other words, it crosses the star from Earth's line of sight, there's a very high probability that on the opposite side of the orbit, it will pass behind the star and from Earth's perspective, the planet disappears. So you can look at the star when, uh, when the planet is in, your, in, in view, and when it's not in view, you subtract the two results. If you do this in infrared, you can see the light curves of these stars at the bottom, and that tells you the temperature of the planet's upper atmosphere. So this has also been done on several known planets, uh, which is another really important measurement because you can start to learn about the weather patterns in the upper atmospheres of these exoplanets. Uh, another one that was discovered, this was a really major discovery in June 2005, was a planet known uh, as HD 149026b was discovered to transit its star. Uh, and what was really exciting about this one is uh, it's a very small planet. Now, even before, what happened is Jeff Marcy's group discovered the transit, but before they announced it publicly, they, uh, they communicated to some amateur astronomers to try to uh, repeat their observation. One of these amateurs was uh, uh, Ron Bissinger, who uh, lives in Pleasanton, California, near, uh, near uh, Berkeley and Oakland. And you can see his, uh, his light curve here on the right, and this was, he actually made this detection before this planet was even officially announced to the public. What's really impressive about Bissinger's observation is that this is a relatively small planet that causes only a 0 0.003 decrease, a magnitude decrease in the star's brightness. So this shows that amateurs can do very, very sensitive, precise uh, observations. I actually wrote, wrote an article about this for Sky and Talon when I interviewed Jeff Marcy. He said, that is truly beautiful work Ron is doing, and it is contributing to the precision of the radius measurement for the planet. And this is a very strange planet because when uh, astronomers like Sarah Seeger model its interior based on what we now know about its mass and density, uh, they find that this planet is comprised of about one-half to two-thirds heavy elements, things like 
carbon, silicon, iron, not hydrogen and helium. And so the calculated mass of the core of this planet is about 70 Earth masses of heavy elements. So this planet is wildly different from anything we have in the solar system, very different from a gas giant like Jupiter, Saturn, or even Uranus and Neptune. So this was um, a real signal that there's a lot of weird planets out there that we, don't, that we don't have any analogs in the solar system. And it told astronomers, hey, wait a minute, these planets orbiting other stars are not just like similar to the worlds in our solar system, that the planetary zoo in the galaxy is unbelievably diverse. Okay, now the first time that amateurs made a major contribution in discovering a trans transiting exoplanet was just about a year later in 2006 when several different amateurs, including Ron Bissinger, but also Bruce Gary in Arizona, who's been also very active in this type of work, and at the bottom left, Steve Howell in Maine, helped actually discover a transiting exoplanet working with a professional astronomer, uh, Peter McCullough, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Uh, now, two other professionals who were very quick uh, to recognize this very powerful potential contribution for amateurs were Greg Laughlin at UC Santa Cruz at the upper left and Tim Castellano at NASA Ames at the upper right. By the way, for those of you who subscribe to S&T, we had an article in the May issue about exoplanets and how they get in these strange, bizarre orbits. Uh, Greg wrote that feature article. He's actually a really, really good writer. Uh, which belies this notion that scientists can't write for the public. He proves emphatically that that is not true, because he's actually a very good writer. So what they did, I don't want to go through all these bullet points here, but they organized a, wor a global network of both professionals and amateurs to look for um, planets that were already known to exist from the radial velocity studies, but to, they calculated when they should transit their stars if they were in the right line of sight and then get amateurs around the world to look at these stars to see in fact if they would transit. Now most professionals would not do this work because even if a star, a planet is very close to its star, it might only have a 1 to 10 percent probability of being in the right alignment where it will transit. Now if you're a professional and you go to your observatory director and say, I want to do this measurement, but I only have a couple, two, two or three percent of detecting anything interesting, you're most likely going to be saved, you know, your proposal's rejected. But what if you're an amateur astronomer and you can do whatever you want with your telescope in your backyard and you know that if, you know, let's say you do about 10 or 20 stars, sooner or later, even if your probability is fairly low, you do this enough times, you're guaranteed. You know, it's just like if you're playing Russian roulette, you know, if you play it enough times, you're going to fire the bullet. Uh, so, but if you, you know, even if you have low odds, you know, this is not like 0.0001%, this is 1 to 10%. So you do like, you know, 10 or 20 stars, you're going to make a discovery. It's inevitable. So uh, this was the, the strategy that Greg and Tim uh, developed, and they had very little problem getting amateurs to cooperate and join this organization. So very shortly after they organized the campaign, they hit the jackpot. And as I said, this wasn't like where they got lucky. They had the right experiment, the right strategy. It was guaranteed that sooner or later they were going to discover that a known planet from what was transiting its star. It was a guarantee. It was a surefire thing that they were going to find one or more than one. So the first one they found uh, was a planet orbiting the star HD 17156. And this is one where I really wish these stars would have more, you know, poetic names. I get, you know, especially trying to remember all these, these Henry Draper catalog numbers gets a little frustrating. So this was partially discovered by amateurs. And what made this one really significant is you can see the orbit of the planet this planet had a 21.2 day orbit, and also Ooh. notice it's an elongated orbit. Now that sounds really short, 21.2 days, 
But up until then, the previous record holder for the longest uh, orbital period for a transiting exoplanet was 5.66 days. So this was a really different kind of planet than all of the other transiting exoplanets uh, that were known uh, up to that time. Uh, so here we see the discovery light curves uh, by several different astronomers. Uh, the top one is by an astronomer in Italy who got clouded out. The one in the middle is from a professional astronomer in the Canary Islands. Then you can see the third and fourth ones down are from two amateurs in Italy who clearly caught the beginning phases of the transit. In fact, uh, Lopresti got most of it. Now, the reason they didn't get the entire transit, and that's actually the weather map at the lower left, there was clouds that rolled in and covered up Italy. Otherwise, Lopresti and Gaspari would have, would have observed the entire transit. But they got enough of it to really show beyond any doubt that it was real. Uh, then the guy in the Canary Islands, he got the beginning and end, but not the middle. And then you can see Ron Bissinger. Unfortunately for Ron, he easily could have detected it. Unfortunately, the star had, had not yet risen at his location in California when the transit ended. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, the, the, this was a very clear and not a marginal detection. So here we see uh, the two I Italian amateurs, uh, Claudio Lopresti and Daniel Gaspari, who uh, made this discovery. And at the bottom right, when I interviewed Sarah Seeger about this, this was her quote, this is a fantastic historic discovery First, it enables us to study a planet very different from the normal hot Jupiters. This discovery is also historic because amateurs help detect the transits. So this is actually artwork done by Greg Laughlin of what the planet might look like. Because it has such an eccentric or elongated orbit, it experiences a 26-fold variation in the amount of energy it receives from its star uh, during the course of its orbit. So this would not be a very pleasant uh, planet to live on. The temperatures would swing in the upper atmosphere on the day side between 800 and 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, which should drive very high speed winds and very complex uh, meteorology. Okay, then uh, just a couple years later, uh, more Italian amateurs helped smash that record by helping to discover a, 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 transit, a transiting planet with a 111-day orbital period. And for those of you who can see the movie on the left, I mean, you can see the planet spends most of its time relatively far from the star, and then when it comes in, it whips around really, really fast. These are the light curves of the uh, Italians on the right, and then they got the egress, the end of the light curve, or the end of the transit, very, very convincingly. Okay, then, 111 days after that transit was discovered, astronomers knew it was going to transit again, because it has a 111-day period. So a professional astronomer at MIT uh, named Joshua Wynn lined up a bunch of professional and amateur astronomers to observe the next transit. And this led to a very major discovery. And the most important data of this transit uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in June 2009 came from this astronomer in this photo, Don Starkey of Auburn, Indiana. And as Joshua told me when I interviewed him, he said, Don was in the right place at the right time under clear skies and expertly observed the ingress. That's the beginning of the transit. His data proved to be the most valuable of any photometric data that we collected, amateur or professional. Now, this is the work, uh, a composite light curve that Joshua Wynn put together. The data points from Don Starkey are the green, green points in this composite light curve, putting data together from a no number of different uh, amateurs and professionals, a, a composite of both the February and June transits. Now what was very interesting as the star is rotating um, the, and as the planet tran uh, is transiting and uh, you can also take the spectrum and by seeing how much of the red shifted and blue shifted light is being blocked by the planet as it transits, 
you can then, and this is a technique known as the Rossiter-McLaughlin effect that's been used to study eclipsing binary stars. Joshua Wynn was able to show, and this is really bizarre because there's nothing like this in the solar system, that this planet, which remember has a very elongated orbit, is tipped, its orbit is tipped 40 degrees to the star's uh, equator, its rotation axis, uh, which is, there's nothing like that in the solar system. You know, all the planets in the solar system are, you know, within a few degrees of the sun's equator. Uh, so this is unlike anything in the solar system, and this is almost certainly due to complex gravitational interactions between the, the planet, its host star, and we know that this star has a more distant binary companion. So this showed that planets can kind of get yanked out of their formation orbits and, and end up getting parked in orbits that are either very inclined or since this discovery, they've discovered that some of the transiting planets go around their stars in the opposite direction in which they rotate, which is really bizarre. So the current uh, scorecard is we, and I checked this this morning, is we have 312 known transiting exoplanets, many of them discovered in the last few years from NASA's Kepler Space Telescope. Many of them have been detected by amateurs, and as Greg Laughlin said, until recently, that's the Kepler ones, uh, and because those are generally very faint stars, all of the scientifically interesting ones have been detected by amateurs. So this transitsearch.org is continuing its project, uh, and once again, they're looking at planets in eccentric, longer period orbits that professionals rarely <laughs> attempt to observe because of the low probability of transits. So the next, uh, as I get close to the end of my talk, I want to now shift gears to an entirely different method for detecting exoplanets. This method has detected several dozen planets. It hasn't been as rich as radial velocity or transit, but it's still in third place for most planets discovered. And this is a technique that takes advantage of a quirk in Einstein's general theory of relativity that's known as uh, gravitational lensing. Interesting, when Einstein realized this in his, in his equations for relativity, he predicted that this effect exists in nature but we would never actually have the ability to see it in real life. Well, not only have professionals seen it, as I'll show you, even amateurs can now detect, amateur astronomers can detect this effect. So Einstein was brilliant in one aspect, but he was very wrong in predicting, uh, you know, the, he was very limp, you know, back then they, see, they just didn't envision the kind of technological improvements that would occur over the next hundred years. So what happens is if you have a, a background star, let's say uh, orbiting uh, the center of the galaxy in the bulge, you know, like 20,000 light years away, and then you take a star that's, let's say, 10,000 light years away, and it, as it's drifting across, you know, its proper motion, it drifts right in front of the background star. Its gravity will take some of the light rays from the background star, redirect them, that, that would other, light rays that would otherwise not hit Earth redirect them so that they will hit Earth, leading, you can see it there at the upper right, leading to a very beautifully symmetrical increase and then decrease in the light of the background star over the course of maybe several weeks to several months. Now, if the star has a planet around it, that planet near the peak intensity when the alignment is perfect the planet will disturb that perfect symmetry in a way I'll show you in just a minute. So a big step for amateurs was the direct participation in the discovery of a microlensing uh, exoplanet. And once again, kind of an ungainly name, the OGLE stands for the Optical Gravitational Lensing Experiment. The year was 2005. They were looking toward the bulge of our galaxy, that's where the BLG, and it was the 71st uh, microlensing event, except this one, it wasn't just a star, this was a star that had a planet. And there were two New Zealanders, two Kiwis, who played an essential role in this discovery, two amateurs, Grant Christie on the left, 
and Jenny McCormick on the right, and one of the uh, professionals on the team, Scott Gowdy, and I know I'm supposed to say the Ohio State University, <laughs> told me in an interview the amateur data was essential to understand what was going on. And no doubt the best quote in my talk tonight comes from Jenny McCormick, and she said, it just shows that you can be a mother, you can work full time, and you can still go out there and find planets. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, an artist's rendition on the left of what this planet might look like. We really don't know, but we do know it's about three times the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits a star at about 3 AU. That would put it in the asteroid belt, and the star is about 15,000 light years from Earth. Now you can see the light curve here at the lower right, now, the blow, actually, let me get out this uh, laser. I wasn't allowed to use my own because it, cr it puts out a little radio signal. Now, if, if, this, if there had not been a planet, you can see this is a blow up of this peak critical period where the, where the event would have peaked. It, the light curve would have followed this dotted line, but instead it went up, down, and then up again um, at, at that crucial moment. This is a period that was just literally over a day or two, and some of this New Zealand data was right in this critical period uh, where you could see it deviating from prediction. And by the, the way it deviated, uh, that's you can do calculations. Believe me, this is way beyond anything I could do. But from, that, from the way the light was deviated, that's how you get the mass and the approximate distance of the planet. Um, then, uh, not very much later, in 2008, uh, several amateurs, uh, both Grant Christie, Jenny McCormick, uh, an amateur in Italy named Franco Malia, another uh, Kiwi, Tim Natush, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, they actually discovered a microlensing event that had two planets orbiting the lensing star. This one was really interesting because the planets are very much analogous to Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they have masses of about 0.71 and 0.27 Jupiters, and they orbit at about 2.3 and 4.6 AU from a star that's about half the mass of the Sun. So they're a little bit smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. They orbit a little bit closer in, but they're also they're orbiting a less massive star than the Sun. Um, then there was another Jupiter analog uh, discovered in 2008 in which the, the most significant data was produced by Bertu Menard, an amateur uh, in South Africa. You can see him here with his Mead telescope and he uses an S-Big CCD camera. Um, and then there was another one, a sub-Saturn mass planet that Bertu Menard also contributed a lot of data uh, to the discovery. Now, when I interviewed Scott Gowdy at, o at Ohio State about this, he said most of the data that led to the planet discovery was taken by Bertu Menard. The only difference between working with amateurs and professionals is that I don't have to pay the amateurs. I don't know how all of you amateurs in the, uh, I think you should take that as a sign of respect and not uh, you know, like it's using you as slave labor. Um, so uh, there's been many other amateurs have uh, you know, contributed to help discover this planet, which was announced about a year ago, the Ogle uh, BLG 2012 event. And this is interesting, a 0.11 Jupiter mass and a 0.6 Jupiter mass planet. So another double planet system. And these are pretty low mass planets. And this shows you the power of this uh, uh, microlensing technique. For the final part of my talk, then I want to shift gears again. Now, let's say there's some of you in this audience, and you want to discover an extrasolar planet, but you don't want to like learn how. You know, you don't want to buy a CCD camera. You don't want to go through the hassle of learning how to do photometry and reducing your data. Well, it turns out you don't need anything other than a computer an internet connection, and a little bit of enthusiasm. How many of you have all three of these things? A computer, an internet connection, and a little bit of enthusiasm. I have a feeling it's pretty much everybody in, in the room here. What you, what you can do, and you can do this tonight, very simple to remember, planethunters.org, and you can sign up. You get a little tutorial where you look through Kepler data 
and you can start looking for transiting planets that were missed by the Kepler science team and their computers uh, in the Kepler data. Um, it's something that's not that hard to do. Now, I've got the latest update, and since this project got going in December 2010, about 250,000 citizen scientists all around the world have helped professional analyze the light curves of the 160,000 stars in the Kepler data. Uh, one of the members of the team, Meg Schwamm, uh, she told me that there are 13 million analyzed light curves from the citizen scientists this is a little too gender specific, but I hope you agree that's a pretty impressive number, 180 man years. That's a lot of time. Now, what's really impressive is that Planet Hunter volunteers have now identified 20 candidate planets that the Kepler science team missed, and there's undoubtedly more to come. And as Deborah Fisher who was at Yale University, told me, this is the first time that the public has used data from a NASA space mission to detect possible planets orbiting other stars. I think there's a 95% chance or greater that these are bona fide planets. So probably like 19 of those 20 planets are real planets and eventually will be confirmed. And not only do we have those candidates, there is one confirmed planet from the Planet Hunters team. Uh, this, is a, this is an artist rendition here, a planet with a, it's about six times the diameter of Earth, so a little bit bigger than a Uranus or Neptune, in a 20-day orbit around an eclipsing binary. You know, so there's two stars going around each other. Now this planet goes around both stars. It's not orbiting one of the two stars. It, or it's what's known as a circumbinary planet. It's only one of seven known to exist. And we now know, and this is the artist's rendition, that there, it's actually a quadruple system where there's uh, another binary star at a much greater distance from these other two. Um, so this is the only known four-star system, a quadruple star system that has a planet. And this planet was discovered by citizen scientists who just had, you know, looked at these uh, light curves on their computers. So, I mean, this is a very, very significant scientific discovery. And once again, you don't even need a telescope to do this work. Uh, so there's going to be more of these discoveries to come in the future. So I want to conclude by giving you my fearless forecast for what is to come. Uh, amateurs, especially in Europe, have been using uh, these commercially available spectrographs, and they've actually made a number of detections using the radial velocity method of known extrasolar planets. This is a three Jupiter mass planet orbiting the star Tau Budis. They've also detected 51 Pegasi. That was the one Mar uh, Mayor and Kalo, Kalo detected in, in uh, 1995. So the fact that they can detect them they get lucky if they look at the right star with a, with a fairly massive inner planet that hasn't been studied yet, they could discover a planet using this radial velocity technique. So that might happen sometime in the next few years. We're definitely going to get, with Transit Search Org, more amateur detections of long, long period exoplanets. There's going to be more microlensing discovery with amateur participation including findings of very low mass planets, even potentially down to the mass of Earth. And what's really amazing, and you can read our article in the July 2009 issue, if you look at a transit, uh, if you start to see from, from one transit to the next to the next, variations in both the timing and duration of these transits, that could be due to the gravitational perturbations of a moon orbiting the planet. So it is possible that the first detection of a moon orbiting a planet outside the solar system could be made by amateur astronomers. And of course, we're definitely going to get more planets uh, from planethunters.org. So for further information, and I can put this slide up later for those of you who are interested, uh, you know, as I said, this is really the main one to go to. There's lots of good resources on the web. Uh, I just want to point out before I conclude, 
is uh, we have a lot of articles um, about exoplanets in our latest special edition called Astronomy 60 Greatest Mysteries. I actually picked up three copies yesterday on my way here at the Books A Million store in Martinsburg, West Virginia, right off Interstate 81. So it's definitely out there on, the, on newsstands. You can also get it through our website. And we have one copy available for the raffle tonight. And it has lots of great articles by some of the world's leading astronomers, including Jeff Marcy and Sarah Seeger. We've got an article from Britain's astronomer royal, Sir Martin Rees. We've got a couple articles from Greg Benford, who's not only an astrophysicist, but also a well-known science fiction writer. Our latest issue of S&T, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the cover story is about the exoplanet revolution, about all the amazing things we've learned about planets are orbiting other stars. So I just want to conclude with a thank you for your attention. Uh, and, uh, that you have, so I'll answer it before any of you even ask it, is where this photo was taken. And I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this, but this was taken at the UFO Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> so uh, I'll be, uh, I know we do want to get to the raffle, but I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, I see a question over here. Uh, yeah, that's the, supposed to be the Vulcan. I, I can still do it. <laughs> maybe, maybe I've watched too many Star Trek episodes. I, I'm not really a trekker, like I've never gone to a convention, but I, I did, you know, I've watched. I haven't even seen the most recent movie, though, because I heard it wasn't very good. Is, is it good? It is good? Okay, should I go see it then? Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see, question over here. What is it cost? Yeah, you need, you know, you know, and I, you know, you can do this with really small telescopes. If you want to go to fainter stars, you might want a scope of like 8 to 10 inches of aperture. You obviously need a good mount and you need uh, a good CCD camera, but you know, the commercially available ones now from SBIG, Apogee, FLI, there's a whole bunch of companies out there that are making really, really good equipment. So um, let me think a minute here. I think we're talking probably putting everything together. Probably you could do this for less than $5,000, uh, at least the transit uh, and even maybe the micro lensing too. Uh, you know, the main, the main obstacle is you have to really learn how to do the precise photometry but, you know, once again, there are, there are, you know, hundreds of amateurs around the world, or maybe even thousands now, who are doing this, either, you know, exoplanets or variable star work, or, for example, there's amateurs monitoring asteroids to measure their rotation rates and looking for binaries. Um, there's a lot, of, like some of those websites, too, uh, you know, really give very, you know, you know, believe me, how to do this would be the subject of an entire other talk. Um, you know, it's, it, but you do need to have some fairly good technical skills, but they're technical skills that are well within the range of amateurs who are eager to participate. And amateurs like our professionals like Scott Gowdy, Peter McCullough, and Greg Laughlin are going to be willing to spend, and they've, they've done this, willing to spend time with amateurs helping to teach them how to do this, this kind of research. So if you're interested in trying to you know, discover ex-transiting or micro-lensing planets, there's a lot of help available out there. Uh, and once again, these professionals are eager to work with amateurs. It's not like a case like, well, I don't know if I really trust these people. They're like, we want your help, and we're willing to help you along. Let's see, Howie? Well, how do you think of the information that we've gained in the last 15 years or so about exoplanets uh, it could be put together with like Drake's equation. How would uh, that, that, and, and that's a great question, and, and, it's, and Sarah Seeger addresses that in this article. Um, 
what, what I said earlier is we now know that there are at least 100 billion planets orbiting stars. There's probably another 100 billion rogue planets that are cast adrift in interstellar space. So we know that um, planets are very common. We also know that smaller planets are more common than large planets. Now, all the planets er discovered early on were large because they're heavy, they produce a radial velocity signature, and they block more of the star's light, so they're easier to detect by transits. But what Kepler has shown by monitoring 160,000 stars is Kepler is finding many more small planets than large planets. Um, we also are now finding out that planets are very common in the habitable zones of stars, okay? That there's no doubt. So I, I'm going to give you, uh, I would say this is a conserv extremely conservative estimate, okay? There are at least one billion planets roughly the size of Earth, a little bigger, a little smaller, or the size of Earth, orbiting within the habitable zones of stars that are potentially capable of supporting life. So does that mean that people that don't believe that there's other intelligent life in the universe, that they're the crazy ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, and there, there's actually, in, in that special issue about the 60 mysteries, there's a debate about that question be, between Seth Shostak, who's spoken here, I know, at this event, and another astronomer at UCLA named Ben Zuckerman, who uh, I think makes a fairly compelling case that, you know, technologically, because I'm not sure we're intelligent, uh, you know, considering some of the things we're doing, um, and that's the case he makes too. Um, I think Ben makes a very, fairly compelling argument that intelligent life might be very rare or technologically capable life. I'm going to give you my belief, but this is a belief. It's not. Just my gut feeling, because we don't, we haven't discovered life yet on any planet other than Earth. I think that our galaxy probably has at least a billion, probably many more than a billion planets that at least have some kind of primitive life. Uh, I would then, but I would not think that necessarily translates to a lot of planets with highly, you know, developed, you know, technologically capable life because we know on Earth it took a very, very long time for that process, you know, to play out. But we really don't know. I mean, the people who say that they believe in a lot of intelligent life or they don't, you know, we don't really know. We just don't know. So it could go either way. Uh, but I, I, we just don't know. I would bet the number in the Drake equation, the N is a very small number. I, I, but I could be totally wrong and I hope I'm wrong. And I hope you don't think my, I'm crazy. <laughs> Let's see, there's a question back here. Yes? Uh, my first question would be, do those amateur farmers use adaptive optics, or are they doing their discoveries without it? They, they are, as far as I know, I could be wrong on at least a few individuals, there's no adaptive optics, because it's basically you're just measuring the light. Like, you don't have to improve the resolution so much, you just, I mean, here's the thing, if you have a night with really horrible scene, your data for that night's not going to be any good. But as far as I know, this is not being used with anything more than, you know, just good telescopes and CCD cameras. And I don't think they're using adaptive optics. At least most of them are not. Right, that, and that's kind of a variation of the of what's called the Fermi paradox. Like, where are they? If there's other civilizations, you know, once they get you know significantly more advanced than where we are, you know, they should be able to either they or their machines to basically you know colonize the galaxy. I mean, there's calculations that show that this could be done in a few million years, despite the long travel times between stars a sufficiently advanced civilization could do this fairly quickly relative to the life of the galaxy. But they're also following the prime directive. That's right, that could be. I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, I, I, I personally, you know, I've, I've read about UFO stuff. I personally don't find the evidence very compelling, although I know other people would disagree with that. I don't completely rule out the possibility 
that there are other civilizations out there who are aware of our existence and monitoring us. There's no evidence in favor of that, but if, I mean, the Star Trek Prime Directive might hold true here. If they knew about us, would, would, and you know, and let's say they're very mature, they, you know, they've stopped fighting wars, you know, they have incredibly advanced knowledge and technology, do you think that they would want to contact us at this point in our existence? I think they probably would not, that they would, they would be more interested in just watching us see how our civilization evolves without any interference. So, I mean, I don't, I don't completely, dis, you know, I don't give it a high probability, but I, I do not completely exclude that possibility. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, that, you know, here's the thing: if there are other, if there's other alien civilizations, they, you know, NASA was hoping to build a mission that would launch, like in the next ten years or so, called Terrestrial Planet Finder. That if NASA is given the money by Congress to build this mission, we can start uh, measuring the atmospheric composition of of Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable zone of planets within a few dozen light years of Earth. So let's say we find a, an Earth-sized planet orbiting a solar-type star in the habitable zone, and you find, let's say, methane, free oxygen, and water vapor in the atmosphere. That would be maybe not proof, but very extremely powerful evidence that that planet has some form of life on it. Now, Earth has had that signature for hundreds of millions or even billions of years, an alien civilization that would take a spectrum of Earth over the last hundreds of millions or even billions of years would have identified Earth as a life-bearing planet. So the argument is, would you just let Earth drift by or would you send something here to investigate a planet that you have very high confidence has life and learn about life on another planet um, you know, Zuckerman in his counter to Seth's article argues that, you know, intelligent civilization is going to want to do that. Um, so it's certainly true that if there are a lot of other civilizations, you know, somebody's been aware that Earth is a life-bearing planet. If, civiliz you know, technologically civilizations are common because it, the, the ability to launch such a space telescope is really right now within our reach. Like, we have the technology, we could do this, it's a matter of funding, and if we can do this, then certainly civilizations more advanced than ours absolutely could have done, could, could do this or could have done it in the past. Sarah Palin said she saw another civilization from her house. Oh, this is, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's see, she must have a good space telescope, right? Let's see, any others, or do we want to get to the raffle? Uh, yeah. I was wondering if the yeah. amateurs who are searching for planets that are transiting, stars, exoplanets, um, do they look at uh, stars that have already been identified? I mean, how do they pick yeah. stars? Mo that, that's a very good question. Most of the stars they look at are stars that we know have a planet from the radial velocity, because then you can, uh, you, we know there's a planet there, and you can also, from the, light, uh, from the radial velocity plot, you can calculate to within about a 24-hour time period uh, when the planet, and that's what Greg Laughlin does at UC Santa Cruz, he calculates when the planet should transit if it's in the line of sight, and then what you do is you align astronomers around the world at different <coughs> longitudes, so if, you know, because you don't know about weather, we don't know exactly when the transit's going to take place, you can just kind of get a window so then you, you get an, a network of amateurs, so as Earth rotates, if you have enough people doing that observation, it's almost guaranteed you're going to see the transit. If you miss it, then you have to wait. But if it, let's say it's a five-day period planet, you only have to wait five days for the next one. But if it's, let's, let's say it's a planet with like a 200-day period, then you have to wait 200 days for your next opportunity. Now, obviously, too, the closer the planet is to the star, the higher the probability is that it will be in our line of sight. So, I mean, the real jackpot would be to find like a transiting planet with like a, you know, like a 100 day or a 300 day orbital period. I mean, certainly Kepler has done that, um, but for, you know, amateurs are concentrating on a little bit lower, you know, things from like a hot Jupiter with a three or four day period 
out to maybe like 50 to 100 day orbital period. But they're going to find more because, you know, they, they're doing it. There's enough planets known that you do it enough times. It's like the Russian roulette analogy. You do it enough times, you're going to eventually, you know, it's not a matter of luck. It's just a, it's a matter of statistics. Let's see. Uh, yeah, right here. I teach high school science, and so what I want to know is, of this, what do you recommend we could do to get the students doing something? I mean, we obviously can't just run out right. by a telescope, but, but what could we do that be, like, is, is the Planet Hunters yes. website the thing? Planet Hunters would be perfect. In fact, um, Meg Schwamm said a lot of the, the citizen scientists doing Planet Hunters are like a school age. That would be perfect because all the kids need is a computer and an internet connection, and it's something that you you know that you can do you know within like an hour of going onto their website, you can be up and running doing the work. So it's actually it's something it's it's something that's very easy to do. Um, so that I would say they start off with that, and if you have some students who are really ambitious and really you know on their toes. You know, and maybe their parents have the money to buy them equipment, they can later get into looking for the transits. But that's like a whole different level of, of technical detail. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's, you know, some of the student projects that win, you know, like uh, a science awards from these, you know, big corporations, you know, they're doing work of this caliber. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that like a really motivated and talented high school student could do the, the, the photometry work, especially for the transits. So you'd recommend the transits as opposed to some of the other things? Right, yeah, I think you technical. Yeah, exactly. Like, like the, the, uh, the micro lensing is harder, so I would start off with planet hunters. The next step would be the transits, then the micro lensing. Now, doing the, the radial velocity, there's only a handful of amateurs right now that are attempting to do that. So I would put that as the lowest priority. But there definitely seems to be like a line of progression. Let's see, I saw uh, back here. Um, the, um, in, um, the, the, that, that previous question went, was a great lead in for Ryan. I wanted to ask you if you knew anything about the techniques that amateurs are using to do the radial velocity measurements. Because it, as I recall, the, the uh, early discoveries by Kenneth uh, Mayor and Gales and the, uh, the Marcy and Butler, they're uh, they used things like. Um, the hydrogen fluoride cells. Right. You know, to get the uh, comparison lines. Right. Um, Are amateurs doing any, anything really special? Not really. No. Uh, what? And I've actually talked to one of. Let me see if I can go back here. Uh, right here. Uh, well, actually, I guess we can't see it with the lights on. But these off-the-shelf spectrographs, like the ones made by Sheliac Instruments, that's a French company. So I've actually, in fact, I, uh, I saw them at NEF this year is Olivier Tizzy, T-H-I-Z-Y. He's one of the owners of Sheliac Instruments. Now, Sheliac Instruments, this is interesting, this is a company developed by French amateur astronomers, and they're like, we want to do spectrosco you know, spectroscopic research. At the time, there weren't really commercially available spectrographs for amateurs, so they go, well, we'll build one. So they've now turned their invention into a company and using just their own home-built spectrograph that they built themselves, shown in this picture, they've developed, they have detected some of these uh, radio velocity planets, and it's because they produce fairly strong signals. Uh, these are massive planets, you know, the hot Jupiters. My guess is because they don't have that more advanced equipment, a lot of the exo radio velocity planets that are further out they wouldn't be able to, you know, they're only going to get the low-hanging fruit with, with their relatively crude equipment. But it's still, I mean, this is still a very good spectrograph. I mean, good enough to detect a transiting exo or a radio velocity exoplanet. Let's see, maybe I'll take one more because I know we want people want to get to the raffle. Let's see over here. I just have a comment. Now. Yeah. We'll probably never be found by an alien uh, people. If the jerks that run their country fund us like our <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I want to make it very clear: the only barrier to, to to building terrestrial planet finder 
This was a program that was receiving funding a few years ago, and the technology was being developed. There was actually going to be a precursor mission called the Space Interferometry Mission. Uh, this technology was being developed. It's basically taking the interferometry technology that we already use, for example, at the VLA in New Mexico, uh, but also like the Chara array at Mount Wilson, which is using you know, optical and infrared, you adapt that for space uh, so you don't have to look through Earth's atmosphere. This is difficult technology to do it in space, um, but, you know, and I've talked to a number of astronomers about this, there is no, can, no at least foreseeable technological hurdles that say we can't do this. You just need to give the scientists and engineers the resources to do the technology development and the testing. I mean, there, I have no doubt that this is something that if, you know, Congress, you know, our government changed the mind, changed its mind and decided to make this a priority, we could definitely launch Terrestrial Planet Finder like in at least 10 or 15 years from now. And within probably a few years of its launch, we'd be getting spectra of, of Earth-sized planets orbiting nearby stars. The only limit here is not the science or the technology. The limit is the funding. Uh, this is a mission that would probably cost, uh, you know, probably on the order of about $5 billion. You know, on the order of like Hubble, the Cassini mission to Saturn, or the James Webb Space Telescope. It's not, this is not like a $50 billion mission or like a $100 billion human mission to Mars. This is a mission that's basically within the, the same price range of, you know, some of the missions that we've already flown out, out of NASA. So I, I personally think, and I actually wrote an editorial a few years ago in s and I would like to see NASA make this a priority that one of the missions for NASA, for mainly its unmanned program, you know, both solar system exploration and space-based astronomy is to make the detection of life on another planet a major scientific goal of NASA to help focus, uh, you know, future missions to be, you know, designed to focus in on that question. Because I think that's, A, it's a burning scientific question of deep interest to scientists, but B, I think this is a mission that the public can rally around and support is who, I mean, probably all, every one of you in the audience is curious how much life is out there. I mean, if raise your hand if you're not interested in that question. <laughs> yeah, so, so, I mean, this is, this is a great question because it, it's, it's, you know, of interest to the public and the scientific community. And, you know, certainly the first discovery of life on another planet, whether it's on Mars or in the, you know, around an exoplanet by studying its atmosphere, is going to be a watershed event in human history. And it's frustrating for me because I, I don't think the finish line is that far away, you know, where we really, we're getting to the point where this can really happen within the lifetime of everybody in this room, and it's a matter of committing the resources to make it happen. It, we're not limited by the vision of scientists or the ability of our engineers. So, okay, I probably should stop here and uh, so we can... Uh, do the ra I guess there's going to be a short little break, and then am I correct on that, Roy? Yeah, just give us time to get set up. Okay, just, yeah, we'll just get set up, and then we'll uh, do the raffle. Thank you all very much.